Stories of Futures Past presents Five Stories Featuring Time Travel Absolutely No Paradox by Lester Del Rey Time for Survival by George O. Smith Turn Backward, O Time by Walter Kubilius The Unseen Blushes by Alfred Bester Prize Ship by Philip K. Dick Absolutely No Paradox by Lester Del Rey Originally published in Science Fiction Quarterly, May 1951 Narrated by Tom Tresel If time travel is possible, then why haven't we been visited by people from the future? But Pete LeFranc found the answer to that. The old men's section of the Arts and Science Club was always the best ordered. The robots somehow managed to avoid clanking there. The greenswood beyond the veranda was always just right, and the drinks were the best for six counties. Old Ned Brussels touched his glass to his lips appreciatively, sighed in contentment, and waited for some of the other oldsters to break the silence. Finally, Lem Hardy took the plunge. He did it, he announced, referring to a conversation of weeks before. Then, at the puzzled looks he amplified, My grandson, damn it, he's got a time machine. It works. Sent a cat four days up, and it came through unharmed. The glass fell from old Ned's hand, bouncing on the floor and spilling good liquor. A robot came forward silently to clean it up, but Ned didn't look at it. Four days doesn't mean a thing, Lem. Is that kid planning on trying it out? He's going to try it next week. Then for the Lord's sake, stop him. Look, does it work like this? His fingers slipped over the pencil smoothly, as they had always done when he worked, drafting robot bodies in the old days. A rude schematic seemed to grow almost instantly on the paper. Lem took it, then stiffened suddenly. Who told you? A youngster named Pete Lefranc, and it was forty years, no, over fifty years ago. Lem, if you like your grandson, keep him out of the machine. Four days, four weeks, they don't mean anything. Time machines don't work, however well they seem to. A bustle from behind them pulled their eyes around. One of the robots was quietly restraining a nervous young man who was trying to break free and join the group. His face was tense, excited, with an odd bitter fear behind it. His words were seemingly cut out of steel. Told me I'd find him here. Damn it! Sorry, sir, you'll have to wait. The robot's voice was adamant under its smoothness. Ned grunted and then impulse led him to look again. He'd seen the man somewhere. He hunted for it, then dismissed it, knowing that his memory was tricky these days. But he motioned the robot aside. "'We don't allow interruptions for junior members,' he told the man, letting his voice soften the words. "'Still, if you want to sit down and listen, quietly, nobody'll stop you. "'But quietly,' the robot stressed the word. The man looked at it, then swivelled to Ned Brussels. For a moment the bitterness halted, as if frozen, then gave place to a sudden sharp amusement. His eyes searched Ned's, and he nodded, dropping into a chair. Lem took up the conversation again. It worked. And if it works for four days, it should work for four centuries. You're just scared the of paradoxes, end. Ned. Going back and killing your grandfather for your daily such rot. stories. You've been of reading too many past. stories on it. And now, fifty for years the ago, Peter story. Frank said the same thing. Young man, either sit down or get out. This is the old men's section. He had answered for all the paradoxes too, except one question. Ned had been young then, just getting started at synth anatomy drafting, and not rich enough for wine of the type Pete always kept. He sipped it with relish, and looked at the odd cage Pete was displaying. 
All the same, it won't work. Pete laughed. Reality doesn't mean a thing to an artist, does it? Be damned to your paradoxes. There's some answer to them. It did work. The dog appeared exactly four weeks later, just finishing his bark. Then why haven't time machines come back from the future? Ned shot at him. He had been saying that as his final argument, and he sat back to watch the bomb explode. For a second, Pete blinked. You never figure that out yourself. Nope, I got it from a science fiction story. But why haven't they? If yours works, there'll be more time machines built. With more built, they'll be improved. They'll get to be commonplace. People use them. Or someone would turn up here with one. Or in the past. Why haven't we met time travellers, Pete? Maybe we have met them, but didn't know it. Nonsense. You get in that machine and go back to Elizabethan England. Try to pass yourself off as being native to that time, even an hour. No, there'd be slip-ups. Pete considered it, pouring more wine. An idea. But you're right, maybe. I haven't tried going back. If I'd sent the dog backwards, I couldn't have checked up on it. While I would, could be waiting in the future. OK, you've convinced me. Then you're not going in the contraption. Pete's laughter was spontaneous and loaded with amusement. I'm going forward and find out why no one has come back. I've got a nice collection of rare coins I can trade off up there. Should be more valuable. And I'll bring you back a working invention from the next century. With luck, I'll bring you the answer. And after that, maybe I can go back and kill an ancestor just to see what happens. Don't be a fool. But Pete was grinning and opening the door to the cage that rested in the middle of his laboratory. Fifty years this trip, he said, spinning the dials, and you won't have long to wait. I'll come back just about no time. Ned started to yell something. There was a curious flicker, such as he'd seen when Pete sent the dog forward. The time machine blurred over, its surface seeming to stretch into infinity while contracting to nothing at the same time. Then it was gone. Ned groped for the wine bottle, cursing, and drained the contents. Then he sat down to wait. Three days later, the police came looking for Pete on some mysterious tip, probably from a fellow worker. It was a pretty rough time for a while, though they finally decided it was just another mystery, and that Ned's yarn of having been there only to keep an appointment was true. Ned had influential friends, even if he didn't have money then. For three years, he rented Pete's laboratory before he made enough to buy it. For a decade, he lived in it, but by then he'd begun to know that Pete wasn't coming back. The building's still there, old Ned finished. The diagrams of his machines are still in the drawers. But Pete never showed up. I tell you, keep your fool grandson out of time machines, Lem. They don't work. Too many paradoxes. If they'd work... You could steal a future invention, get credit for inventing it, and nobody would ever have to invent it. When things have that many angles that can't work, the thing itself can't work. Lem shook his head stubbornly. It worked. The kid got the cat back. Something just happened to your friend. Maybe his power failed. Then he wouldn't have gotten all the way, and he'd have reappeared years ago. Pete measured things and there was no displacement in space. If something had happened to him, the machine would have been there anyhow. Besides, I had alarms wired to call the police in, told him it was to protect a safe the minute he showed up. He never showed up. He never came back. So I supposed he just disappeared? Time ate him up? Lem's stubbornness was cracking a bit, though. His voice was higher than even an old man's should be. I don't know. But time machines don't work. Otherwise, they're where are the time travellers from the future? They sat quietly for a second. Ned was remembering the years up to the time he'd given up, disconnected the alarms, and come here to the Arts and Science Club to live. He'd been stubborn. Maybe a little bit. But Pete hadn't reappeared. Behind him, the young man cleared his throat and the robot moved forward. But there was no rule against intrusion when no one was speaking, and the robot came to a stop. 
Ned looked back, just as the man decided the robot wouldn't interfere. There was more amusement on the man's face now, but the bitterness still lay there. He grinned at Ned, a familiar grin, and his voice was flat and positive. Time machines work, and there are no paradoxes, absolutely no paradoxes. Lem stirred, craning back, and Ned bristled, but something about the younger man caught back the words as he picked up the thin thread of memory. The other grinned again, wryly. It's simple. Time machines work in one direction. They can't go back. Your time traveller found that out too late. No trips to the past, no return from the future, and no paradoxes, Ned Brussels. He came to his feet, moving over to drop into the chair beside Ned. The older man nodded, stretching out his hand. I told you not to try the damned machine, Pete. Ned told him. Then he chuckled as the oldest cliché among old friends meeting again came to his lips. Fifty years, and you haven't changed a bit, Pete Lefranc. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Time for Survival by George O. Smith Originally published in Fantastic Universe, March 1960 Narrated by Tom Trissel The storm ruined my plan. Not by seek-sickness. I'd come prepared for the worst, knowing how rough it could get on a sailing ship of the 19th century. I outrode the storm easily, stowed away in the hold. Not even the breakage of some of the seventeen hundred barrels of alcohol carried as a cargo bothered me, although the stench was terrific. But on the morning on the 25th of November, 1872, the first mate, Albert Richardson, sent the second mate, Andrew Gilling, below with two other German seamen to assay the storm damage. They found me, and I was hauled aloft before Captain Briggs as a stowaway. Captain Briggs, of the Mary Celeste, eyed my strange clothing with deep curiosity, but his interest was obviously more concerned with my unauthorised presence. He said sternly, "'When did you get aboard?' I realised that I had to impress him. I smiled. "'You delayed your sailing from the 5th of November to the 6th, so that you and Mrs. Briggs could have dinner to board the Gracia with Captain Morehouse,' I said. "'How can you know so much?' he exclaimed. How can you live as a stowaway for almost twenty days? I held up my chronothon contractor, knowing that now I could impress him indeed. Captain Briggs, I said, I am a time-travelling historian from the twenty-second century. I pointed to the big red button on the top. Until I depress this button and return to my own day and age, every morning I receive my daily ration of food and water. It's about... I timed it close. I was interrupted by the click of the chronothon as its time transferred my daily ration. I opened the cabinet and offered a bite of twenty-second century breakfast to the captain. He said, This is a sailor's tall tale, I think. You claim that you're a time-travelling historian? Then tell me, why are you here on Mary Celeste? Captain Briggs, I said, the time machine was invented in 1987. Within twenty-seven years, every historical event had been painstakingly researched and authentically written, rewritten by time-travelling historians who viewed the event as partaking eyewitnesses. By my time, fame and fortune awaits any man who has the luck and dogged determination to scour historic time to locate some event that has not been recounted faithfully to the last niggling little detail. Why, Captain Briggs? In Jim Bishop's famous The Day Columbus Landed, they record the name of the man who owned the hen that laid the egg that Columbus stood on end to impress Isabella with his ability. And so, Captain Briggs, I stowed away because I... A woman's voice interrupted me. I turned to look at the captain's wife, who, of course, was the only woman aboard Mary Celeste. She was carrying little Sophia Matilda in her arms. She said, Edward, what unearthly manner of ship is that? The steward... Edward Head replied, "'I don't rightly know, man.' I turned to look. 
No more than fifty feet from the starboard rail was a vast barge. Upon the barge were serried rows of seats that stretched upwards and backwards for hundreds of feet. The seats were filling rapidly. Ushers were escorting the spectators efficiently. Vendors were selling refreshments and programmes. A thrumming sound came from overhead, and I looked up to watch the materialization of jet copters and personnel carriers, and even a poised spacecraft hanging in a dome above our heads. Over the lee rail came a crew of technicians carrying the heavy Ward Workman Tri-D recorders of the 27th century, and the director pulled a script from his pocket and said, Joe, you and Pete dislocate the binnacle and break the compass. Al, open the fore hatch and Nazareth. Tony, that spring round chronometer is a pre atomic clock and worth a fortune at the National Museum. Put it among my personal loot, along with the sextant. You can keep the ship's register, but give the navigation books to George with my compliments. Let's see them. Sails, jibs, fore topmast. Now toss the all overboard, get it out of the way. It's missing. One of his men came up and said something to him that I could not hear. Now, he replied. It would not be more dramatic to dummy up a half-eaten breakfast and a pan of milk warming on the stove for the baby. Too many writers tried to make it that way in the beginning. I know what's authentic. Then he paused as a ward workman cameraman panned around Mary Celeste making close-up and approach shots. One by one they finished their work and reported to him. Fine, he said, looking at his strap watch. Now let's back off for some long shots, and remember... We don't know what kind of catastrophe is going to be, so keep those tidy recorders running constantly until I tell you to stop. Captain Benjamin Spooner Briggs of Mary Celeste put an arm around his wife. To me, he said, I don't completely understand, but I do get enough to realise that we are the subject of something evil. Yes, I replied, you. We're not waiting here to let it happen to us, he snapped. But you can't change history, I objected. Watch, he said roughly. And then, with a stentorian voice, Captain Briggs roared, Abandon ship! The captain and his wife, still carrying their daughter Sophia Matilda, mingled with the photo recording crew. The two mates, the steward, and the four German seamen went over the side and swam swiftly for the barges. There were flurries of activity when they went aboard the barges, but then the activity stilled, and I was alone on Mary Celeste. I looked around me and realised that Captain Briggs hadn't changed history. He'd made it. Slowly, the barges emptied. The spectators returned to their own time and place among the centuries. Sorrowfully, I pressed my button and went home. My fame would never be. My fortune would never start. My book would remain unwritten, for I knew full well that potential customer for this historic event had been here, as an eyewitness. After seeing it, who'd bother to buy my book? On the 4th of December, 1872, Captain Morehouse of Di Gracia sighted Mary Celeste yawing in a mild sea with jib and four topmast sails set, no one at the helm and no one aboard. The binnacle was knocked out of place, the compass was broken, the sextant, the chronometer, ship's register, and navigation books were missing. The ship's yawl, lashed to the main hatch, was missing. The fore hatch and lazarette were open, and about a dozen of the ship's cargo of 1,701 barrels of alcohol were broken or leaking badly. The last notation in the ship's deck log had been made early in the morning of 25th of November, 1872, and the account of the previous hours indicated that Mary Celeste had come through a severe storm on the previous day and most of the night. Accounts that include half-eaten plates of food, half-packed bags and other evidences of an abrupt interruption and panicky flight for safety are false. No survivors have ever turned up. No explanation can be given. Researchers in The Mystery of Mary Celeste suggest that the storm, the leaking alcohol, combined to frighten Captain Briggs with a threat of fire or explosion, and that they all took off in the ship's yawl, which floundered. We will not to know the truth until someone invents the time machine. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story... 
Turn Backward, O Time, by Walter Kubelius. Originally published in Science Fiction Quarterly, May 1951. Narrated by Tom Trussell. Adel W. Crane, C.D. Donovan held the identiplast in his hands, the fingers trembling slightly. What do the letters C.D. stand for? he asked, determined to play the part of an honest citizen who had no interest in unlicensed rejuvenation or time travel. The chalk-faced young man, with a fixed smile, told him, Cyclic detection. You may have heard our more dramatic nickname, Criminal Destroyers. I've been an agent since 2452. High-strung Donovan moistened his lips. Of course he has heard of the CD. In an age where cyclic travel backward through the centuries was an established science, the comitet that governed the home planet had to employ ruthless measures to cope with any experimenters whose uncontrolled work might threaten to change past temporal cycles. The CD were the scavengers of the World Comitet. They scoured the past centuries, eliminating illegal and unlicensed cyclic travellers. In a rigidly controlled solar system there were thousands of lawbreakers, political disappointees, and even youth seekers like Donovan, who hoped for life extensions in past ages. The CD, with terror and all the resources of the solar system, hunted them down and exterminated them quietly, ruthlessly, and painfully. The criminal Blascom, Crane said, the fixed smile still on the thin lips, has been observed near the Donovan metallurgical plants. The comitet suspects that someone close to your office may have established contact with him for illegal rejuvenation. His eyes left Donovan's taut face and scanned the office walls. Control boards recording operations in extraterrestrial metallin plants lined two sides of the office. The only break in the sternness of the walls was an antique painting, a still-life abstraction that must have dated way back to the 20th century. Crane stared at his flashes of colour, the fixed smile turning to amused contempt. Donovan dared not ask for additional details. The word or whim of the comitet was law. Criminal destroyer, Donovan shuddered. He had spent the past six months in quietly transferring ownership of the trust to various fronts for Blascom. A fortune worth several erg units squared to the sixth power had already changed hands. Had the CD caught him before Blascom could deliver on the rejuvenation and time escape deal? We have nothing to hide, Donovan said. My staff will cooperate with the CD. I assume you want access to the psycho record files? Adel W. Crane, contemptuous eyes turning away from the still life, reached a bony hand for the approval slip. I will let you know what I find. Donovan stood up, and when the CD agent left, he frantically sent out a conscious call to Blascombe's thought frequency number. By the comitet, Blascombe's wave induced voice rang in Donovan's ears. I told you never to call me unless it was most urgent. This is urgent, Donovan thought desperately. Crane, a CD agent, was here a minute ago. He's going to look over the books of the Trust. He won't find a thing, Blascombe's thoughts were confident in Donovan's mind. They haven't caught a single one of the men I've sent back into the 70th century. Just be patient, and we'll cyclic you out within a week. Then hurry! My heart's in a bad shape and I can't last much longer. I'm practically being kept alive by that rotten Callistin serum. Stay alive for one more week, Blascombe thought encouragingly, and you'll be young for centuries. Turn backward, turn backward, O oh time in thy flight. The song sped through Donovan's mind, lifting his spirits. To be young again and to be free from the constant supervision and threat of the terrifying C.D. As for Crane, Blascombe went on, it's part of the service I'm giving you. We've arranged a false lead case in your office. Crane has his talons set for your brother-in-law. Shortly before the C.D. annihilates him, your escape will be arranged to throw suspicion upon him. 
We will make it seem that your brother-in-law killed you for denouncing him to the CD. Crane will never see through the subterfuge. You will be safe, perhaps forever. His brother-in-law's life was a cheap price to pay for youth. Donovan stared at his stiff, corpse-like hands. All he needed was one more week. He would make one more effort to secure a life extension, and then... The examiner for the Board of Life waited while Donovan dressed. The answer could already be seen in the official's eyes. No? I'm sorry, the examiner said, but the laws of the Comitet are fairly stringent. Only those whose social value is above par 195 may be rejuvenated. Not much value is placed upon engineers and trust managers who can easily be replaced from each year's birth quota. The application is denied, and there's no use appealing it. It's unjust, Donovan exclaimed, ignoring the alarming pain in his failing heart. All I want is ten more years, not even a full return to youth. If there's no room on home planet, let me go their extraterrestrials or even some asteroid. I'll make any contribution required to— the examiner, who had often heard such vain pleas, wrapped his desk with a blood analyscope. The Comitet is far too wise to permit socially unnecessary extensions of the lifespan, just as it does not permit unlicensed time travel. What would happen if we allowed you to be rejuvenated and then permitted extraterrestrial immigration? There would be millions of old or sick people like you demanding equal treatment and equal consideration. Before long, the planets and asteroids would be overpopulated and independent colonies set up thereon, which would eventually come in conflict with the home planet Comitet. No, my friend, the Comitet is wise in decreeing that rejuvenation and human birth are mutually contradictory. Rather than sacrifice birth, with the consequent stagnation of the human species, the Comitet has decided rigidly to control youth extensions, and grants those periods of additional life only to the socially valuable. Yes, Donovan said bitterly, the Comitet keeps itself immortal while the rest of us have to die. The examiner's voice was hard. Shall I denounce you to the CD? I beg forgiveness, Donovan said. Your decision is as just one, and I shall make no appeal. Blascombe had a very persistent thought call. Donovan relaxed in the office chair and let his consciousness level sink to the call number. This is the moment, the thought patterns registered. The CD is about to close in with the faked evidence we've prepared. Your brother-in-law's about to call. Trust in me, all is ready. Do not become frightened, for excessive adrenaline might upset the required endocrine balance. Before he could frame a reply, Blascombe's thought faded away. The office door slid open, and Adel W. Crane walked in. Donovan's heart throbbed painfully. Was this an unexpected crisis in their plans, or had Blascombe prepared even this? The CD has finished its analysis, Crane said. I thought you might be interested. Naturally, I... The case was very simple. I wish citizens would realise that they cannot fight against the enormous resources of the CD. We will destroy... The public screen flashed urgently. Donovan excused himself and turned the knob. His brother-in-law's angry face switched into view. "'Donovan, that was a dirty, rotty thing to do. What right did you have to denounce me to this CD? I should kill you for this!' Donovan's bewilderment was genuine. He felt Crane's eye upon him, and a thrill of admiration for Blascombe's genius suddenly swept through him. "'What do you want?' he managed to say. I've got to see you immediately. I'm downstairs, in the back of the pilot cab station. Later. Now! The image snapped off. Donovan turned to the seedy agent. S Excuse me for a moment, he stammered. Some family trouble. I'll be back in a short while. Crane glanced up. I'll wait. Donovan walked through his office, conscious that he was doing this for the last time. Rejuvenation was like death. He put an end to a lifetime casually and without haste. At the pilot cab station, the wind cutting down from the whir of swooping cabs, Donovan met Blascombe. There were two bright flashes and then the smell of disintegrated flesh. 
Blascombe gestured toward two graying pools on the plasticide floor in back of them. Murder and suicide, he said, obviously pleased with himself. The CD will think you are dead. The murderer's body is also there to provide a motive for the transfer of the trust's funds in the event Crane becomes too thorough. He'll be here soon. We'll work fast now. The special pilot cab dropped them into a gravity-shielded warehouse above the European desert. It housed Blascombe's laboratory. The rejuvenation process was even simpler than Donovan had expected. Not the fountain of youth exactly, Blascombe explained as he plunged in the needle, but a selective antibody that attacks only ageing tissue and forces replacements practically on an embryonic level of activity. Unlike the Callistin serum, which is merely a stimulant, this antibody created from its destroyed tissue a catalyst capable of stimulating chromosomes and genes. By the very process of feeding upon itself, the body grows younger. The net result is a reversal of the life process, an anabolism making you grow younger year by year. Eventually to disappear as a single cell? Ultimately, yes. Long before that period, probably when you're a young man, you'll have to return to 2482 for a reversion to normal metabolism. The process can be repeated? Indefinitely. Donovan breathed deeply. Immortality. Blascombe did not smile. Only if the CD does not find you. Unlicensed rejuvenation is punishable by execution in an extremely painful manner. You're a doomed man now, if the CD even finds you. The worst tortures of the Middle Ages would be nothing compared to what Crane would do to you or me if he tracks us down. You can stay in the present time cycle, Donovan said, but I'm tired of control and supervision. Send me to some period where an individual had a chance to work and live without state control. Give me the times of individualism. CD agents are everywhere in the time cycles, tracking down illegal immigrants. Quite a number of the men I've rejuvenated chose the Renaissance for escape, but I'm afraid that a good part of that cycle's carnage was the work of such CD agents as his friend Crane. I'd recommend another period. The Golden Age of Greece? Blascombe shook his head. Already taken. Aristotle, Plato, and a few others are 25th century men. Archimedes was murdered by a CD agent, and Socrates sent to his death by a group of them. Their fates were known to history. Why did those men leave the 25th century to live in that cycle? He shrugged his shoulders. They probably felt that the few years of extra life were worth it. Well, into what period do you want to go, and what would you do there? I do not understand the paradoxes, Donovan said. What if I chose to build gravity deflectors in ancient Rome? It would be impossible, because there were no such manufacturers then. It would mean that you were either promptly killed by a CD agent who recognised the anachronistic attempt, or you had changed your mind. But if I can choose any period, it means that I can alter history at will, which presumes that the present can also be changed. That is what the Comitet believes and that is why the CD is so ruthless and brutal with unlicensed time travellers. The real answer is that in the final analysis, your decision to choose a certain time period is already made, and the things you will do are already determined. Free will is an illusion. It is synonymous with incomplete perception. Then send me into the 20th century. As an engineer, I will be able to make some sort of living there. Dangerous. Don't practice your profession. Study some field which is completely alien to you so that should you come across a seedy agent, he would not recognise the work of a 25th century man. You mean like an artist or a writer? Why not? Donovan laughed. I've never held a paintbrush or written more than a one-page letter, but why not? Unloose the cyclic band, Blascombe. Set me loose in the 20th century and give my regards to the CD. In the dimly lighted garret above the tavern, Donovan stood before his easel. 
His face was no longer lined, for the past twenty-five years had made him a much younger man. He had taken Blascombe's advice and had studied a field completely alien to him. In his own time, the twenty-fifth century, his paintings would have been considered laughably amateurish, but for 1926 they were infinitely superior to anything produced by twentieth-century artists. "'Why can't they see?' he asked his agent angrily when his third show passed without the sale of a single painting. "'I can see them,' the agent said, standing in front of a still-life abstraction with flashes of colour. "'But your way of working is too far advanced for our time. Believe me, a few hundred years from now your paintings will be regarded as the work of a great genius. In the meantime, I starve.' I can help you. Donovan threw down the paintbrushes. No, no, there's no use being ahead of one's time. I can't make a living as an artist. I may as well go back to digging ditches. Maybe you can work part-time and paint at night. What do you do before you started painting? He hesitated. But what was there to be afraid of? I, I was an engineer. I can get you a job with a construction company. No, no! I want nothing whatever to do with engineering. Nothing! In the twenty-five years that he had lived in the twentieth century, he had turned from a man of sixty-five to a healthy, robust forty. For a long time he had lived in fear that the dreaded arms of the CD would reach out for him and that he would stand face to face with terror-inspiring Crane but he had never met anyone who seemed to be a C.D., a criminal destroyer. Sometimes he felt the avenging sword of the Comitet hanging over his head. There were some statesmen and philosophers mentioned in the newspapers whose ideas seemed to indicate a 25th century origin, but he avoided them in the fear that they might be plants to draw out the illegals. It was probably that the C.D. would never find out the deception and if they did, there was little chance of locating him among the two billion people on home planet. "'You have to make a living somehow,' the agent persisted. "'I know nothing but engineering,' Donovan said, "'and that I will never do. "'Maybe there's some other field on which you can use engineering skills,' he thought for a moment, then reached into his briefcase. "'I'll pick this up on a newsstand. You might like it.' Donovan glanced at the magazine's cover. It's the latest thrill, scientific fiction. Maybe with your engineering knowledge you could write a story or two. When the agent left, Donovan read through the magazine, then went out to look up other stories of the same nature. One story offered a time travel theory which was absurdly inaccurate. Another purported to deal with the inhabitants of Mars none of which looked at all the way the writers imagined them to be. Donovan read as many as he could find, and was fascinated by the hopeless incompetence and scientific inaccuracy of the so-called writers. The time travel story was laughable. Even a child could produce a far more exciting tale by describing the Watch and Gorovich experiments that led to the discovery of repetitive time cycles back in 2364. Why not? he thought to himself. Why not write these stories of the future? Who could do them better than a man who had come from the future? These were not engineering journals where accuracy was required, nor would anyone ever act upon the scientific discoveries he might record. Above all, no one would attempt to build any machines which would immediately attract the attention of the CD. He would do nothing which would in the slightest way affect historic development. Pressed by the need for money, and fascinated by the possibilities in science fiction, Donovan began to write a story. He employed a pen name, and avoided the th general theory of retrograde cycle travel backward above time, but limited himself to travelling spirally into the future. He described the mechanism he himself would have to produce in order to get back to Blascombe for anabolism correction, and produced a fanciful tale regarding life in the year 3000. The letter from the editor came within a week. Dear Mr. Donovan, 
Enclosed find check for your story. Turn backward, O time. I have seldom read a more convincing fantasy. One could almost believe that the apparatus you described would actually work. I believe this story will be a science fiction classic, and I am placing your original manuscript in my collection. I would appreciate seeing other examples of your work. When the story appeared in print, several paragraphs describing the construction of the time machine were omitted by the editor. Technically unconvincing, they told him. They mar up the verisimilitude of a great story. Turn backward, O oh time, became an instant success. A few days later, Donovan contributed another story, this time based on actual events on Jupiter, which he simply transferred to a different time cycle on Vega. Vaguely recalling some warning of Blascombe's that while the future could not be changed, it was best to play safe and not draw the attention of the CD. He twisted and changed all the scientific facts involved. The check for the second story was promptly sent. Within a few months, Donovan, under his pseudonym, which was kept secret, was launched upon his career as a writer of science fiction. Readers praised him for his convincing fantasy, and editors competed for his services. Memory of the 25th century gradually faded from his mind as years passed. At times he awoke in horror after nightmares that crane of the CD had finally caught him, but these terrifying dreams became rarer. He had exposed himself repeatedly in fiction. Time and time again he had described actual historical events of the space colony wars in his stories. On one occasion he described the technique for the cure of cancer discovered in 2019. The reader's section of the magazine soon carried letters from doctors who were amused that a writer could present such a simple household remedy and dare suggest that it might be efficacious for cancer. Donovan was amused by the thought that Crane might be diligently searching for him somewhere in the Renaissance. If so, the CD's agent's fury must be mounting. He changed his name and identity every ten years to conceal his gradual return to youth. He had the pleasure of seeing himself hailed as his successor in popularity, as he established new names and let the older ones die out. His excuse to the editors was that he wanted to enter into competition anew, make sure that his name alone was not carrying the story. He was happy. Sometimes, however, later stories were panned by his fans as imitations of the classics by the greatest SF writer the world has ever known. Only the ageing gentleman who had brought Donovan's first manuscript knew, but the old man signed the cheques and said nothing. In his happiness and self-satisfaction, Donovan became more careless with his stories. If he had been able to outwit Crane and the dreaded CD, surely he could dash off stories good enough for the poor minds of twentieth-century science-fiction readers. Then the tide turned. Fan letters in the magazines began really to tear into his fiction. They were third-rate, they lacked imagination. They were ordinary stories written by an ordinary mind, and science fiction required tales written by men whose minds were well ahead of twentieth-century thought. The day finally came when all the editors began rejecting his stories. First one, then another and finally every story written received a rejection slip. Donovan could not understand the reason for the change. A few years ago, or was it decades, each story of his was labelled a classic. Now they were not even acceptable. Had science fiction changed so much since his decision to become a writer in 1929? He dared not discuss it with anyone for he had no friends and he trusted no one. The CD was everywhere, but there was one man in whom he had the deepest confidence. Donovan visited the ageing editor and felt sorry for the worn-out old man. He himself had once been like this, but was now free from death. He thought of taking his benefactor with him into the 25th century and saving the editor's life. But suppose Blascombe's laboratory had been captured. 
Donovan could manage for himself, but it would be cruel to leave the old man in the deadly hands of the C.D. No, it was best to say nothing about rejuvenation to the editor. He would only think Donovan was trying out a story idea. "'I've been your editor for thirty years,' the old man's voice cracked. His half-blind eyes loomed through thick lenses. "'It's been a long time,' Donovan said. "'My my eyes are not what they used to be,' the other said. "'A man about fifty years old wrote that great classic, "'Turn backward, O time. "'He must be about eighty now, but you look only twenty. "'Ah, laddie, you're trying to fool me. "'You must be his son.' "'That's right,' Donovan said quickly. "'We have the same name.' "'Then that explains it,' the other said wearily. "'It would break my old heart if a talent like your father's disintegrated. "'But we came to talk about your stories. "'No, son, you're not the writer your father was. "'Your tales lack imagination. "'There is no originality in them. "'The ideas are hackneyed, the writing third-rate.' They sound like poor imitations of the great tales told by your father. There was a man. There was a writer. Donovan left him, keeping the secret of his identity. Then returned to his home, he looked in the mirror, and the face of a rose-cheeked twenty-year-old youngster stared back at him. Fifty years of happy living in the twentieth century. It would soon be necessary to return to the 25th century so that Blascombe could reverse the antibiotics catalytic process that had set him growing younger. It was impossible to stay in his present youthful state much longer. In a few years he would be a child. With a sigh he walked to his desk, took out paper and pen, and began to draw the diagrams for the apparatus which would send him forward into the 25th century. For three hours he worked confidently, and then the sweat began to drip from his forehead, and his heart began to pound fearfully. "'It is not possible,' he said uneasily. "'It will all come back to me soon. Now what the devil did Blascombe tell me?' He had become lazy, and his brain was not used to hard work. He said this to himself, but he could not shake off the sense of fear. He took a cold shower, rubbing himself briskly, then shot a stimulant into his bloodstream. Preparing the desk once more, he began to work. The papers gathered, the pencils broke, and the night gradually turned to morning. The finished sketch of the cycle travellers was basically correct, but the most important operating mechanism was still missing. Try as he could was unable to bring it up from his memory. "'By the soulless system,' he swore. "'What is the matter with me? I have forgotten every detail.' He tried to think back. At one time he had known the mechanism thoroughly. As an engineer he was completely familiar with every single plate and tube, but now he couldn't remember anything but the general appearance of the finished machine. Fear spurred his mind as he hunted for a solution. Something was happening to his mind. He began to think of his stories. The same thing had happened there. At one time he remembered every detail of life in the twenty-fifth century and could describe them easily. Now events were dim, and he knew now why his recent stories were poor. They were not written from actual memory of the future but were the ordinary stories one might expect from a twenty-year-old boy. The past was dim, and memory faded. Blascombe and Crane, Crane and Blascombe. Which was the CD agent, and what was CD anyway? Enough of the details remained to shock him into his awareness of his desperate plight. The rejuvenation process had worked too well, for Donovan had waited dangerously long. As the body grew younger, the tissue cells were consumed and youthful cells replaced them. The process that had worked for body cells did the same for the cells of the brain. Those portions of the brain containing the knowledge and ability of a seventy-year-old man were gradually being replaced with new, untrained cells. 
he had failed to re-educate himself as new cells replaced the old and had come to the brink of disaster. Sufficient intelligence and manual dexterity remained to compensate for that, but in a few years the task would be hopeless. Excitedly, for he knew his life depended on it, he rummaged through his bookshelves looking for a copy of his first story, Turn Backward, O Time. It contained, he remembered, a concise, accurate description of the mechanism for the time machine. The magazine itself was old, the sheets turning brown and the pages breaking. He read the story in haste, vaguely remembering the plot. The actual description of the operating mechanism, he found to his consternation, was missing. I will cut one or two paragraphs, the editor had said. They are not convincing technically. They lack verisimilitude. Not convincing. If he did not find them, he was doomed to become a child, and then a babbling idiot of a baby, and would disappear entirely within twenty years. He telephoned the magazine's office and asked for the editor. Sorry, the secretary said. Miss Rostone is quite ill. The doctors are afraid he might not pass through the night. He's very old, you know. Can he speak? Donovan asked desperately. He's had a stroke. Can't say a word. Completely paralysed. Sorry. Donovan cursed the carelessness that had led him to this difficult position. He knew that O'Sloane kept the originals of his favourite stories in the collection in his office. If O'Sloane died, it was possible that some enterprising youthful editor would destroy the old manuscripts in a fit of house-cleaning. "'This is Donovan,' he said quickly. "'I'm trying to locate the original copy of Turn Backward, O Time, which O. Sloan has in his files. I must study the original papers. It's extremely important. Is there a substitute editor? Will you ask him to keep an eye open for it?' "'Certainly!' He sighed and took a taxi to the editorial office. It would be best to get it as quickly as possible. The original manuscript was quite safe. Donovan need only copy the original description. Even if he were no longer able to grasp the theory of it, the machine was still easy enough to build from the description. Within a few hours he would be back in the 25th century for a reversal. For his next trip back he would choose ancient Egypt. The 20th century was heading for the atomic wars and he was fortunate in being able to escape. After Egypt, he would choose the Inca civilization. Did they not have legends of white gods that ruled them? The world was his, and he would be forever young. Immortality was within his grasp. No one could stop him now. He arrived at the building and rushed up the steps to the editorial office. "'We found the manuscript, Mr. Donovan,' the secretary told him rightly, looking twice at the flushed, handsome face. Donovan stepped into O'Sloan's office. Practically nothing had been touched as yet, for one of the staff editors had just begun to sort a pile of stacked papers from several cabinets. Donovan recognised the original manuscript of Turn Backwards, O Time, upon the desk, and hurriedly skimmed through the pages. The description was intact, and while he could not remember why such a machine would work, he knew that it could be built, and he could escape. With a sigh, he pocketed the manuscript and introduced himself to the young editor who would probably succeed O'Sloan upon his death. "'Oh, yes,' the editor, with a curious thin smile, said. "'I have heard quite a bit about you, and have been waiting a long time for this meeting. We've met before, you know.' "'Really?' Donovan said. The face did appear familiar, but he could not recall the occasion. "'My name is Adel W. Crane, C.D.' Donovan felt a cold tremor of fear shake his body. He moistened his lips. "'What do the letters C.D. stand for?' The pasty-faced young man closed and then locked the door of the office. Walking toward Donovan, the smile no longer there, he told him, then he did what he had come to do. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, 
for the next story. The Unseen Blushes by Alfred Bester Originally published in Astonishing Stories, June 1942 Narrated by Tom Trussell With all kinds of plots twisting in my head, I hadn't slept well the night before. For one thing, I'd worked too late on a yarn that wasn't worth it. For another, there'd been a high wind howling through the streets. It made me restless and did a lot more damage than that. When I got up, I found it had blown a lot of paper and junk in the window and most of the story out. Only a part of the carbon was left. I wasn't especially sorry. I got dressed and hustled down to the luncheon. L that luncheon's something special. We meet every Tuesday in a second-rate restaurant and gossip and talk story and editors and mostly beef about the mags that won't pay until publication. Some of us, the high-class ones, won't write for them. Maybe I ought to explain. We are the unromantic writers, what they call pulp writers. We are the boys who fill the pulp magazines with stories at a centre word. Westerns, mystery, wonder, weird, adventure. You know them. Not all of us are hacks. A couple have graduated to the movies. A few have broken the slicks and try to forget the lean years. Some get four cents a word and try to feel important to literature. The rest come to the luncheon and either resign themselves to the one cent rate or nurse a secret Pulitzer Prize in their bosoms. There wasn't much of a turnout when I got there. Belcher sat at the head of the table as usual, playing the genial host. He specialises in what they called science fiction. It's fantastic stuff about time machines and the fourth dimension. Belcher talks too much in a southern drawl. As I eased into a chair, he called, Ah, the poor man's Orson Welles, and crinkled his big face into a showy laugh. I said, Your dialogue's getting as lousy as your stories. I don't like to be reminded that I look like a celebrity. Belcher ignored that. He turned to Black, the chap who agents our stuff, and began complaining. He said, Landsake, Joey, can't you sell that Martian story? I think it's good. Before Joey could answer, Belcher turned to the rest of us and said, Reminds me of my granddaddy. He got shut up at Vicksburg before his father could locate him and drag him back home. Granny used to say, All my life I've believed in the solid South and the Democratic Party. I believed they were good, and if they aren't, I don't want to know about it. Belcher laughed and shook his head. I gave Joey a frantic SOS. When Belcher gets going on the Civil War, no one else gets a word in for solid hours. Joey didn't move, but he said, What story? very incredulously, and then he glanced at me and winked. That Martian story, Belcher said, the one about the colony on Mars and the new race of Earth-Mars men that springs up. I've forgotten the title. They say Fitz James O'Brien never could remember the titles of his stories either. Joey said, You never gave me any such yarn, and this time he really meant it. Belcher said, You're crazy. Down at the other end of the table, someone wanted to know who O'Brien wrote for. I said, He's dead. He wrote The Diamond Lens. He was the first pulp writer, Belcher said. Most folk believe Poe invented the short story. Land's sake. Poe never wrote a short story. He wrote mood pieces. O'Brien was the first. He wrote great short stories and great pulp stories. I said, if you're looking for the father of the pulp industry, why don't you go back far enough? There was a boy named Green in the late 16th century. You mean Groat's worth of wit, Green? The very same. Only forget that piece of junk. It was his last grab at a dollar. Get hold of a catalogue some day and see the quantity of pulp he poured out to make a living. Pamphlets and plays and what not. Someone said, Green? A pulp writer? He sounded shocked. I said, Brother, when he turned that stuff out, it was pulp. Passes three hundred years and it turns into literature. You figure it out. 
Belcher waved his hand. I was talking about the invention of the short story, he said. O'Brien. I tried to cut him off. I thought O'Brien predated Poe. It was a mistake. Belcher said, not at all. O'Brien fought in the Civil War. He was with the 37th Georgian Rifles, I believe, a captain, he. I nudged Joey so hard he yelped, but he said, I tell you I never received any such story. Then Mallison grunted and sipped his drink. He started to talk, and we missed the first few words. It's always that way with Mallison. He's white-haired, incredibly ancient-looking, and he acts half-dead. He used to be in the Navy, so he writes sea stories now. They say he acquired a peculiar disease in the tropics that makes him mumble most of the time. He turns out a damned good yarn. Finally, we figured out Madison was calling Joey a liar. "'Say, what is this?' Joey said indignantly. "'Are you kidding?' Mallison mumbled something about Joey stealing a story of his that never got paid for and never showed up. Belcher nodded and poured wine from a bottle. He always drinks a cheap kind of stuff with the greatest ostentation. He acts as though it makes you more important if a drink comes out of a bottle instead of from a glass on a tray. He said, I'll bet some mag paid two cents for it, Joey, and you're holding out. Joey snorted. You better look in your desk, Belcher. You probably forgot to give me the yarn. Belcher still shook his head. I know I haven't got it. I can't think how I lost it. He broke off and glanced up at some people who were threading through the restaurant toward our table. There came a man, followed by a couple. The lone man I knew, although I never remember his name. He's a quiet little fellow who smokes what looks like his father's pipe. Joey says he's past forty and still lives with his folks, who treat him like a child. One of the pair was Chinks McDougall. He turns out a fantastic quantity of detective fiction. None of his yarns are outstanding. In fact, they're all on a consistent pulp level. That happens to be why he sells so much. Editors can always depend on Jinx never to fail them. Jinx had a stranger with him. He was a tall, slender young man with scanty tow-coloured hair. He wore thick glasses that made his eyes look blurry, and he was dressed in a sweater and ridiculously tight little little knickers. He smiled shyly, and I could swear his teeth were false, they were so even. I said, you got a hell of a nerve, Jinx, if this guy's an editor, and I really meant it. Editors are taboo at the luncheon, it being the only chance we get to knock them in unison. Jinx said, hi everybody, this here is a white man that'll interest you, name of Dugan. Found him up in one of the publishing offices trying to locate the pulp slaves, says he's got a story. I said, pass, friend, and have a drink on us. Jinx sat, and Dugan sat. He smiled again and gazed at us eagerly, as although we were the flower of American letters. Then he studied the table, and it looked as though he was itemising the plates and glasses all the while Jinx was making introduction. Belcher said, Another customer for you, Joey. Even if Jinx hadn't given it away, I would have told you he was a writer. Land sakes, I can smell the manuscript in his back pocket. Dugan looked embarrassed. He said, Oh no, really, I've just got a story idea, so to speak. I... He said a lot more, but I couldn't understand him. He mumbled something like Mallison, only his speech was very sharp and clipped. It sounded like a phonograph record with every other syllable cut out. Jinx said, Dugan comes from your hometown, Mallison. Whereabouts? Mallison asked. Knight's Road. Knight's Road? You're sure? Dugan nodded. Mallison said, Hell, man, that's impossible. Knight's Road starts outside the town and runs through the old quarry. Oh, Dugan looked flustered. Well, there's a new vention. A new what? Vention, Dugan stopped. Then he said, A new development. That's a slang word. Mallison said, why, man, I was back home less than a month ago. Wasn't any development then. Belcher said, Maybe it's very new. Dugan didn't say anything more. I hadn't listened much because I was busy watching his fingers. He had one hand partially concealed under the table, 
but I could see that he was fumbling nervously with an odd contraption that looked like a piece of old clock. It was a square of metal the size of a matchbox, and at one end was a coil of wire like a watch spring. On both faces of the box were tiny button like adding machine keys. Dugan kept jiggling the thing absently and pressing the buttons. I could hear the syncopated clicks. I thought, this guy is really soft in the head. He plays with things. Belcher said, sure you're not a writer. Dugan shook his head, then glanced at Joey. Joey smiled a little and turned away because he's very shy about ethics and such. He doesn't want people to think he runs around trying to get writers on his string. Mallison said to Jinx, well, what in hell is this story? Jinx said, I don't know, ask him. They all looked at Junior G-Man. I wanted to warn him not to spill anything because pulp writers are leeches. They'll suck the blood right out of your brain. You have to copyright your dialogue at the Tuesday luncheons. Dugan said, it's, it's about a time machine. We all groaned, and I didn't worry about Dugan's ideas any more after that. Joey said, oh God, not that. The market's sick of time stories. You couldn't sell one with Shakespeare's name on it. Dugan actually looked startled. What's the matter? Belcher asked, showing off his erudition. You got a manuscript with Shakespeare's name on it? Discover a Shakespeare autograph on a pulp story? He laughed uproariously, as though he had cracked a joke at my expense. Dugan said, No, no. Only that's the story. I mean, he faltered and then said, I wish you'd let me just tell you this story. We said, Sure, go ahead. Well, Dugan began, perhaps it isn't very original at that, but it's what you might call provocative. The scene is the 23rd century, over 300 years from now. At a great American university, physicists have devised a, a time machine. It's a startling invention, of course, just as the invention of electric light was startling. But its operation is based on sane physical laws, Never mind the explanations, Belcher interrupted. We've all alibied a time machine at one time or another. Land's sakes, you don't even have to any more. You just write time machine and the readers take the rest for granted. When the story begins, Dugan continued, the machine has been in use for several years, but for the first time it should be used for literary purposes. This is because back in the first half of the 20th century there lived a great writer, he was so great that modern critics call him the new Shakespeare. He's called that not only for his genius, but because, like the original Shakespeare, almost nothing is known of his life. Mallison said, that's impossible. Not altogether, I argued. It's conceivable that wars and unprecedented bombings and fires could destroy records. Why, even today there are gaps in the lives of contemporary artists that will never be filled up. To hell with that, Mallison said. I still say it's impossible. Dugan gave me a grateful look. He said, anyway, that's about what happened. The literature department of the university is going to send one of its research men back through time to gather material on the life of the new Shakespeare. This man is an expert in ancient English. He's shuttled back into the 20th century, equipped with camera and stenographic devices and all that. In the short period at his disposal, he attempts to get hold of his man. I said, it's a cute idea. Imagine going back to the old mermaid tavern and buying Marlow a drink. Mallison said, it's a hell of a dull story. I don't know about that, Belcher said. I did something of the sort a couple of years ago. Got a cent and a half for it, eh, Joey? Also a bonus. Joey said, Say, Dugan, you're not cribbing Belcher's yarn, are you? Certainly not, Dugan looked shocked. Well, the research man had less than a day. There was some trouble locating the new Shakespeare's address, and when he did, it was already late at night. Now here's the first little surprise. The man lived in the Bronx. We smiled back at him, because most of us live in the Bronx. Maybe it was kind of sour smile, but we appreciated the irony. No bohemian Greenwich village, no romantic New England retreat, just unadulterated Bronx. Dugan said he lived in an ordinary apartment house, one like a million others. 
The research man hadn't time enough for formality, so at three in the morning he learned how to operate the self-service elevator, went up to the apartment and broke in to snoop around. He expected, at least, to find something different, to see in the furniture and decorations and books an outward sign of the new Shakespeare's great talent. But it was just a plain apartment, so plain that it needs no description. When I say there are a million others like it, I've described it down to the ultimate detail. What did he expect? Joey asked. Genius? Isn't that what we all expect of genius? Dugan countered. Certainly, the research man was disappointed. He sneaked a look at the sleeping genius and saw a dull, undistinguished person thrashing ungracefully about on the bed. Nevertheless, he crept around silently, taking motion pictures and, at 3 a.m., Oh, well, Dugan said, cameras of the 23rd century and all that, you know. Could be, Jink said, infrared photography. The little guy with the pipe bobbed his head as though he'd invented infrared rays. Then, Dugan went on, he went to the new Shakespeare's desk and gathered all the manuscripts he could find, because in his time there were no surviving manuscripts from his hand. And now, here's the final surprise. Don't tell me, Jinx said, he'd gone to the wrong apartment. Belcher said, no, that's what I used. The surprise is, Dugan said, that the research man is doing this work for his doctorate, and he knows he'll never get his degree, because even coming back to the time of the new Shakespeare, he can't gather enough material. Dugan looked around expectantly, but it had laid an egg. There was an uncomfortable pause while Mallison mumbled bitterly to himself. Jinx was very unhappy and tried to say complimentary things. I suppose he felt responsible. Only I wasn't doing much supposing, because I had the most peculiar sensation. I believed Dugan's story. I was thinking of that manuscript that had blown out the window, and I trying to remember whether I'd used a paperweight to anchor it down. I was thinking of that gadget with buttons, and I was realising how this mysterious Dugan slipped from one tense to another, which is a thing all writers are conscious of, and which began to have psychological import for me. But the most convincing thing of all was how the others were looking at Dugan. Belcher was staring keenly from under his black eyebrows. Belcher, who wrote that sort of stuff, and who should have been sophisticated. The little guy with the pipe was absolutely electrified. I knew it couldn't be the story, because the story was lousy, even for pulp. Finally, Dugan said, That's all there is. How do you like it? Mallison said, It's Dinks, and probed in his pockets for cigarettes. What was this new Shakespeare's name? Belcher asked slowly. Dugan said, I haven't decided yet. The little guy took the pipe out of his mouth. What was the name of the story it took? Belcher said, Yes, what was it? Dugan shrugged and smiled. I haven't decided yet. It's not really important, is it? I said, Dugan... When was that manuscript taken? I know it was foolish, but I had to ask, and none of the others seemed to think it peculiar. They leaned forward with me and waited for Dugan's answer. He looked at me, still smiling, and as I stared at those very blurry eyes behind the vast thick lenses, I began to shake with uncertainty. In all that blur there was a strangeness, a something. Oh, hell! Suddenly Belcher began to laugh. He laughed so hard he overturned his wine bottle and we all had to scurry out of the wet. When it came time to sit down again, the spell was broken. Anyway, the luncheon was over. When I got outside, Joey was standing there with Dugan. He was saying, I'm afraid you haven't got much of a yarn there. Dugan said, I suppose so. Only he didn't seem put out. He shook hands with us cheerfully, said he hoped he'd see us again, and turned toward Broadway. We all waved once, just to be polite, and then lost all interest. We turned on Joey to see if we could get the price of that lunch out of him, and we kidded Jinx about the lousy stories he picked up. Maybe it was because some of us felt a little self-conscious. I know I glanced over my shoulder and felt guilty when I noticed Dugan standing on the corner. 
He was watching us intently and adjusting his glasses with both hands. Then I stopped haggling with Joey and turned around because, well, because it occurred to me that cameras of the 23rd century could be so small you couldn't see them at that distance. All that flash and glitter couldn't be coming just from Dugan's glasses. Yes, brother. I turned around while Gray's elegy went thrumming through my head. It could be Belcher or Jinx or Mallison, or the little guy with the pipe, but I don't think so. I've got a pretty good idea who it is, because something suddenly occurred to me. I turned around to give Dugan a nice full face, and I waved. Because one of those scraps of paper I thought had been blown in my window was marked very peculiarly in red. Load only in total darkness. Expires December 18, 2241. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Prize Ship by Philip K. Dick Originally published in Thrilling Wonder Stories, Winter 1954 Narrated by Tom Trussell General Thomas Groves gazed glumly up at the battle maps on the wall. The thin black line, the iron ring around Ganymede, was still there. He waited a moment, vaguely hoping, but the line did not go away. At last he turned and made his way out of the chart wing, past the rows of desks. At the door Major Silla stopped him. "'What's wrong, sir? No change in the war?' "'No change. What'll we do?' "'Come to terms. Their terms. We can't let it drag on another month. Everybody knows that. They know that.' Licked by a little outfit like Ganymede, if only we had more time. But we don't. The ships must be out in deep space again, right away. If we have to capitulate to get them out, then let's do it. Ganymede, he spat. If we could only break them. But by that time... By that time, the colonies won't exist. We have to get our cradles back in our own hands, Groves said grimly, even if it takes capitulation to do it. No other way will do. You find another way, Groves pushed past Scylla out into the corridor, and if you find it, let me know. The war had been going on for two Terran months with no sign of a break. The system senate's difficult position came from the fact that Ganymede was the jump-off point between the system and its precarious network of colonies at Proxima Centauri. All ships leaving the system for deep space were launched from the immense space cradles on Ganymede. There were no other cradles. Ganymede had been agreed on as a jump-off point, and the cradles had been constructed there. The Ganymedans became rich, hauling fright and supplies in their tubby little ships. Over a period of time, more and more Gany ships took to the sky, freighters and cruisers and patrol ships. One day, this odd fleet landed among the space cradles, killed and imprisoned the Terran and Martian guards, and proclaimed that Ganymede and the cradles were their property. If the Senate wanted to use the cradles, they paid, and paid plenty. Twenty percent of all frighted goods turned over to the Gany Emperor left on the moon, and full Senate representation. If the Senate fleet tried to take back the cradles by force, the cradles would be destroyed. The Ganymedans had already mined them with H-bombs, the Gany fleet surrounded the moon, a little ring of hard steel. If the Senate fleet tried to break through, seize the moon, it would be the end of the cradles. What could the system do? And at Proxima, the colonies were starving. You're certain we can't launch ship into deep space from regular fields? A Martian senator asked. Only Class I ships have any chance to reach the colonies. Commander James Carmichael said wearily. A Class I ship is ten times the size of a regular intrasystem ship. A Class I ship needs a cradle miles deep, miles wide. You can't launch a ship that side from a meadow. 
there was silence. The great Senate chambers were full, crowded to capacity with representatives from all the nine planets. The Proxima colonies won't last another twenty days, Dr. Bassett testified. That means we must get a ship on the way sometime next week. Otherwise, when we do get there, we won't find anyone alive. When will the new lunar cradles be ready? A month, Carmichael answered. No sooner? No. Then apparently we'll have to accept Ganymede's terms. The Senate leader snorted with disgust. Nine planets and one wretched little moon. How dare they want equal voice with the system members? We could break their ring, Carmichael said, but they'll destroy the cradles without hesitation if we do. If only we could get supplies to the colonies without using space cradles, a Plutonian senator said. That would mean without using Class One ships. And nothing else will reach Proxima? Nothing that we know of. A Saturnian senator arose. Commander, what kind of ships does Ganymede use? They're different from your own? Yes, but no one knows anything about them. How are they launched? Carmichael shrugged. The usual way, from fields. Do you think? I don't think they're deep space ships. We're beginning to grasp at straws. There simply is no ship large enough to cross deep space that doesn't require a space cradle. That's the fact we must accept. The Senate leader stirred. A motion is already before the Senate that we accept the proposal of the Ganymedans and conclude the war. Shall we take the vote, or are there any more questions? No one blinked his light. Then we'll begin. Mercury, what is the vote of the first planet? Mercury votes to accept the enemy's terms. Venus, what does Venus vote? Venus votes... Wait! Commander Carmichael stood up suddenly. The Senate leader raised his hand. What is it? The Senate is voting. Carmichael gazed down intently at a foil strip that had been shot to him across the chamber from the chart wing. I don't know how important this is, but I think perhaps the Senate should know about it before it votes. What is it? I have a message from the first line. A Martian raider has surprised and captured a Ghani research station on an asteroid between Mars and Jupiter. A large quantity of Ghani equipment has been taken intact. Carmichael looked around the hall including a Ghani ship, a new ship, undergoing tests at the station. The Ghani staff was destroyed, but the prize ship is undamaged. The radar is bringing it here so it can be examined by our experts. A murmur broke through the chamber. I put forth a motion that we withhold our decision until the Ganymedean ship has been examined. A Uranian senator shouted, Something might come of this. The Ganymedians have put a lot of energy into designing ships, Carmichael murmured it to the Senate leader. Their ships are strange, quite different from ours. Maybe... What is the vote on the motion? the Senate leader asked. Shall we wait until this ship can be examined? Let's wait, voices cried. Wait, let's see. Carmichael rubbed his jaw thoughtfully. It's worth a try, but if nothing comes of this we'll have to go ahead and capitulate. He folded up the foil strip. Anyhow, it's worth looking into. A Ghani ship, I wonder. Dr. Earl Bassett's face was red with excitement. Let me by, he pushed through the row of uniformed officers. Please, let me by. Two shiny lieutenants stepped out of his way, and he saw, for the first time, the great globe of steel and rexenoid that was the captured Ganymedean ship. Look at it, Major Silla whispered. Nothing at all like our own ships. What makes it run? No drive jets, Commander Carmichael said. Only landing jets to set her down. What makes her go? The Ganymedean globe rested quietly in the centre of the Terran Experimental Laboratory, rising up from the circle of men like a great bubble. It was a beautiful ship, glimmering with an even metallic fire, shimmering and radiating a cold light. It gives you a strange feeling, General Groves said. Suddenly he caught his breath. You don't suppose this... this could be a gravity drive ship? The Ganys were supposed to be experimenting with gravity. What's that? Bassett said. 
a gravity drive ship would reach its destination without time lapse. The velocity of gravity is infinite, can't be measured. If this globe is... Nonsense, Carmichael said. Einstein showed gravity isn't a force, but a warpage, a space warpage. But couldn't a ship be built using... Gentlemen, the Senate leader came quickly into the laboratory, surrounded by his guards. Is this the ship? This globe? The officers pulled back, and the Senate leader went gingerly up to the great gleaming side. He touched it. It's undamaged, Scylla said. They're translating the control markings so we can use it. So this is the Ganymedean ship. Will it help us? We don't know yet, Carmichael said. Here come the think men, Groves said. The hatch of the globe had opened, and two men in white lab uniforms were stepping carefully down, carrying a semanti box. What are the results? the Senate leader asked. We've made the translations. A Terran crew could operate the ship now. All the controls are marked. We should make a study of the engines before we try the ship out, Dr. Bassett said. What do we know about it? We don't know what makes it run, or what fuel it uses. How long will such a study take? the leader asked. Several days at least, Carmichael said. That long? There's no telling what we'll run into. We may find a radically new type of drive and fuel. It might even take several weeks to finish the analysis. The Senate leader pondered. Sir, Carmichael said, I think we should go ahead and have a test run. We can easily raise a volunteer crew. A trial run could begin at once, Groves said, but we might have to wait weeks for the drive analysis. You believe a complete crew would volunteer? Carmichael rubbed his hands together. Don't worry about that. Four men could do it. Three outside of me. Two, General Groves said. Count me in. How about me, sir? Major Silla asked, hopefully. Dr. Bassett pushed up nervously. Is it all right for a civilian to volunteer? I'm curious as hell about this. The Senate leader smiled. Why not? If you can be of use, go along. So the crew is already here. The four men grinned at each other. Well, Grove said, what are we waiting for? Let's get us started. The linguist traced a meter reading with his finger. You can see the Gany markings. Next to each we've put the Terran equivalent. There's one hitch, though. We know the Gany word for, say, five, Zaf. So where we find Zaf, we mark a five for you. See this dial? With the arrows at Nessie, at zero, See how it's marked? 100, Lib. 50, Car. 5, Zaf. 0, Nessie. 5, Zaf. 50, Car. 100, Lib. Carmichael nodded. So? This is the problem. We don't know what the units refer to. 5. But 5 what? 50. But 50 what? Presumably velocity. Or is it distance? Since no study has been made of the workings of this ship, you can't interpret? How? The linguist tapped a switch. Obviously, this throws the drive on. Mel, start. You close the switch, and it indicates EO, stop. But how you guide the ship is a different matter. We can't tell you what the meter is for. Groves touched a wheel. Doesn't this guide her? It governs the brake rockets, the landing jets. As for the central drive, we don't know what it is or how you control it once you start it. Semantics won't help you, only experience. We can translate numbers only into numbers. Groves and Carmichael looked at each other. Well, Groves said, we may find ourselves lost in space or falling into the sun. I saw a ship spiral into the sun once, faster and faster, down and down. We're a long way from the sun, and we'll point her out toward Pluto. We'll get control eventually. You don't want to unvolunteer, do you? Of course not. How about the rest of you? Carmichael said to Bassett and Scylla. You're still coming along? Certainly. Bassett was stepping cautiously into his spacesuit. We're coming. Make sure you seal your helmet completely. Carmichael helped him fasten his leggings. Your shoes next. Commander, Groves said. The finishing on the vid screen. 
I wanted it installed so we could establish contact. We might need some help getting back. Good idea, Carmichael went over, examining the leads from the screen. Self-contained power unit? For safety's sake. Independent from the ship. Carmichael sat down before the vid screen, clicking it on. The local monitor appeared. Get me the garrison station on Mars, Commander Vecchi. The call locked through. Carmichael began to lace his boots and leggings while he waited. He was lowering his helmet into place when the screen glowed into life. Vecchi's dark features had formed, lean jawed above his scarlet uniform. Greetings, Commander Carmichael, he murmured. He glanced curiously at Carmichael's suit. You're going on a trip, Commander? We may visit you. We're about to take the captured Ganny ship up. If anything goes right, I hope to set her down at your field sometime later today. We'll have the field cleared and ready for you. Better have emergency equipment on hand. We're still unsure of the controls. I wish you luck, Vetchi's eyes flickered. I can see the interior of your ship. What drive is it? We don't know yet. That's the problem. I hope you will be able to land, Commander. Thanks. So do we. Carmichael broke the connection. Groves and Stiller were already dressed. They were helping Bassett tighten the screw locks of his earphones. We're ready, Groves said. He looked through the port. Outside, a circle of officers watched silently. Say goodbye, Stiller said to Bassett. This may be our last minute on terror. Is there really much danger? Groves sat down beside Carmichael at the control board. Ready? His voice came to Carmichael through his phones. Ready. Carmichael reached out his gloved hand toward the switch marked Mel. Here we go. Hold on tight. He grasped the switch firmly and pulled. They were falling through space. Help! Dr. Bassett shouted. He slid across the upended floor, crashing against a table. Carmichael and Groves hung on grimly, trying to keep their places at the board. The globe was spinning and dropping, settling lower and lower through a heavy sheet of rain. Below them, visible through the port, was a vast rolling ocean, an endless expanse of blue water as far as the eye could see. Scylla stared down at it, on his hands and knees, sliding with the globe. Commander, where, where should we be? Some place off Mars, but this can't be Mars. Groves flipped the brake rocket switches one after another. The globe shuddered as the rockets came on, bursting into life around them. Easy does it, Carmichael said, craning his neck to see through the port. Ocean? What the hell? The globe levelled off, shooting rapidly above the water, parallel to the surface. Scylla got slowly to his feet, hanging onto the railing. He helped Bassett up. OK, Doc. Thanks, Bassett wobbled. His glasses has come off inside his helmet. Where are we? On Mars already? We're there, Groves said, but it isn't Mars. But I thought we were going to Mars. So did the rest of us. Groves decreased the speed of the globe cautiously. You can see this isn't Mars. Then what is it? I don't know. We'll find out, though. Commander, watch the starboard jet. It's overbalancing. Your switch. Carmichael adjusted. Where do you think we are? I don't understand it. Are we still on Terra or Venus? Groves flicked the vid screen on. I'll soon find out if we're on Terra. He raised the all-wave control. The screen remained blank. Nothing formed. We're not on Terra. We're not anywhere in the system, Groves spun the dial. No response. Try the frequency of the big Mars sender. Groves adjusted the dial. At the spot where the Mars sender should have come in, there was nothing. The four men gaped foolishly at the screen. All their lives they had received the familiar sanguine faces of Martian announcers on that wave. Twenty-four hours a day. The most powerful sender in the system. Mars sender reached all the nine planets and even out into deep space and was always on the air. Lord, Bassett said, we're out of the system. We're not in the system, Grove said. Notice the horizontal curve. This is a small planet we're on, maybe a moon, 
but it's no planet or moon I've ever seen before, not in the system, and not the Proxima area either. Carmichael stood up. The units must be big multiples, all right. We're out of the system, perhaps all the way around the galaxy. He peered out the port at the rolling water. I don't see any stars, Bassett said. Later on we can get a star reading, when we're on the other side, away from the sun. Ocean, Scylla murmured, miles of it, and a good temperature. He removed his helmet cautiously. Maybe we won't need these after all. Better leave them on until we can make an atmosphere check, Groves said. Isn't there a check tube on this bubble? I don't see any, Carmichael said. Well, it doesn't matter if we— Sir, Scylla exclaimed, land! They ran to the port. Land was rising into view on the horizon of the planet. A long, low strip of land, a coastline. They could see green. The land was fertile. I'll turn her a little right, Grove said, sitting down at the board. He adjusted the controls. How's that? Heading right toward it, Carmichael sat down beside him. Well, at least we won't drown. I wonder where we are. How will we know? What if the star map can't be equated? We can take a spectroscopic analysis, try to find a known star. We're almost there, Bassett said nervously. You better slow us down, General. We'll crash. I'm doing the best I can. Any mountains or peaks? No. It seems quite flat, like a plain. The globe dropped lower and lower, slowing down. Green scenery whipped past below them. Far off, a row of meagre hills came finally into view. The globe was barely skimming now, as the two pilots fought to bring it to a stop. Easy, easy, Groves murmured. Too fast. All the brakes were firing. The globe was a bedlam of noise, knocked back and forth as the jets fired. Gradually, it lost velocity until it was almost hanging in the sky. Then it sank, like a toy balloon, settling slowly down to the green plain below. Cut the rockets! The pilots snapped their switches. Abruptly, all sounds ceased. They looked at each other. Any moment, Carmichael murmured. Plop! We're down, Bassett said. We're down. They unscrewed the hatch cautiously, the helmets tightly in place. Scylla held a Boris gun ready, as Groves and Carmichael swung the heavy rexenoid disc back. A blast of warm air rolled into the globe, swelling around them. See anything? Bassett said. Nothing. Level fields. Some kind of planet. The general stepped down onto the ground. Tiny plants. Thousands of them. I don't know what kind. The other men stepped out, their boots sinking into the moist soil. They looked around them. Which way? Scylla said. Toward those hills? Might as well. What a flat planet. Carmichael strode off, leaving deep tracks behind him. The others followed. Harmless-looking place, Bassett said. He picked a handful of the little plants. What are they? Some kind of weed? He stuffed them into the pocket of his spacesuit. Stop! Scylla froze, rigid, his gun raised. What is it? Something moved through that patch of shrubbery over there. They waited. Everything was quiet around them. A faint breeze eddied through the surface of green. The sky overhead was a clear warm blue with a few faint clouds. What did it look like? Bassett said. Some insect. Wait. Scylla crossed to the patch of plants. He kicked at them. All at once a tiny creature rushed out, scuttling away. Scylla fired. The bolt from the Boris gun ignited the ground, a roar of white fire. When the cloud dissipated, there was nothing but a seared pit. Sorry, Scylla lowered the gun shakingly. It's all right. Better to shoot first on a strange planet. Groves and Carmichael went up on ahead, up a low rise. Wait for me, Bassett called. He fell behind the others. I have something in my boot. You can catch up. The three went on, leaving the doctor alone. He sat down on the moist ground, grunting. He began to unlace his boot slowly, carefully. Around him the air was warm. He sighed, relaxing. 
After a moment he removed his helmet and adjusted his glasses. Smells of plants and flowers were heavy in the air. He took a deep breath, letting it out again slowly. Then he put his helmet back on and finished lacing up his boot. A tiny man, not six inches high, appeared from a clump of weeds and shot an arrow at him. Bassett stared down. The arrow, a minute splinter of wood, was sticking in the sleeve of his spray suit. He opened and closed his mouth, but no sounds came. A second arrow glanced off the transparent shield of his helmet, then a third and a fourth. The tiny man had been joined by companions, one of them on a tiny horse. "'Mother of heaven!' Bassett said. "'What's the matter?' General Grove's voice came in his earphones. "'Are you all right, doctor?' "'Sir, a tiny man just fired an arrow at me.' "'Really? There, there's a whole bunch of them now. "'Are you out of your mind?' "'No!' Bassett scrambled to his feet. A volley of arrows rose up, sticking into his suit, glancing off his helmet. The shrill voices of the tiny men came to his ears, an excited, penetrating sound. "'General, please come back here.' Groves and Scylla appeared at the top of the ridge. "'Bassett, you must be out of—' They stopped, transfixed. Scylla raised the Boris gun, but Groves pushed the muzzle down. "'Impossible!' He advanced, staring down at the ground. An arrow pinged against his helmet. "'Little men, with bows and arrows!' Suddenly the little men turned and fled. They raced off, some on foot, some on horseback, back through the weeds and out the other side. "'There they go,' Scylla said. "'Shall we follow them, see where they live?' "'It isn't possible,' Groves shook his head. "'No planet has yielded tiny human beings like this. So small!' Commander Carmichael strode down this ridge to them. "'Did I really see it?' You men saw it too, tiny figures racing away. Groves pulled an arrow from his suit. We saw and felt. He held the arrow close to the plate of his helmet, examining it. Look, the tip glitters, metal tipped. Did you notice their costumes? Bassett said. In a storybook I once read, Robin Hood, little caps, boots. A story, Groves rubbed his jaw a strange look suddenly glinting in his eyes. A book. What, sir? Scylla said. Nothing. Groves came suddenly to life, moving away. Let's follow them. I want to see their city. He increased his pace, walking with great strides after the tiny men who had not got very far off yet. Come on, Scylla said, before they get away. He and Carmichael and Bassett followed behind Groves, catching up with him. The four of them kept pace with the tiny men who were hurrying away as fast as they could. After a time, one of the tiny men stopped, throwing himself down on the ground. The others hesitated, looking back. "'He's tired out,' Scylla said. "'He can't make it.' Shrill squeaks rose. He was being urged on. "'Give him a hand,' Bassett said. He bent down, picking the tiny figure up. He held him carefully between his gloved fingers, turning him around and around. Ouch! He set him down quickly. What is it? Groves came over. He stung me! Bassett massaged his thumb. Stung you? Stabbed, I mean, with his sword. You'll be all right, Groves went on after the tiny figures. Sir, Scylla said to Carmichael, this certainly makes the Ganymede problem seem remote. <laughs> it's a long way off. I wonder what their city will be like, Groves said. I think I know, Bassett said. You know? How? Bassett did not answer. He seemed to be deep in thought, watching the figures on the ground intently. Come on, he said, let's not lose them. They stood together, none of them speaking. Ahead, down a long slope, lay a miniature city. The tiny figures had fled into it across a drawbridge. Now the bridge was rising, lifted by almost invisible threads. Even as they watched, the bridge snapped shut. "'Well, Doc,' Scylla said, "'this what you expected?' Bassett nodded. "'Exactly.' The city was walled, built of grey stone. It was surrounded by a little moat. Countless spires rose up, 
a conglomeration of peaks and gables, tops of buildings. There was furious activity going on inside the city. A cacophony of shrill sounds from countless throats drifted across the moat to the four men, growing louder each moment. At the walls of the city figures appeared, soldiers in armour, peering across the moat at them. Suddenly the drawbridge quivered. It began to slide down. Descending into position, there was a pause, then— Look! Groves exclaimed. Here they come! Scylla raised his gun. My lord, look at them! A horde of armoured men on horseback clattered across the drawbridge, spilling out onto the ground beyond. They came straight toward the four space-suited men, the sun sparkling against their shields and spears. There were hundreds of them, decked with streamers and banners and pennants of all colours and sizes, an impressive sight on a small scale. "'Get ready,' Carmichael said. "'They mean business. Watch your legs.' He tightened the bolts of his helmet. The first wave of horsemen reached Groves, who was standing a little ahead of the others. A ring of warriors surrounded him, little glittering armoured and plumed figures hacking furiously at his ankles with miniature swords. "'Cut it out!' Groves howled, leaping back. "'Stop!' "'They're going to give us trouble,' Carmichael said. Scylla began to giggle nervously as arrows flew around him. "'Shall I give it to them, sir? One blast from the Boris gun, and—' "'No, don't fire. That's an order.' Groves moved back as a phalanx of horses rushed toward him, spears lowered. He swung his leg, spilling them over with his heavy boot. A frantic mass of men and horses struggled to right themselves. "'Back,' Bassett said. "'Those damn archers!' Countless men on foot were rushing from the city with long bows and quivers strapped to their backs. A chaos of shrill sound filled the air. "'He's right,' Carmichael said. His leggings had been hacked clean through by determined knights who had dismounted and were swinging again and again, trying to chop him down. "'If we're not going to fire, we'd better retreat. They're tough.' Clouds of arrows rained down on them. "'They know how to shoot,' Groves admitted. These men are trained soldiers. Watch out, Scylla said. They're trying to get between us. Pick us off one by one. He moved toward Carmichael nervously. Let's get out of here. Hear them, Carmichael said. They're mad. They don't like us. The four men retreated, backing away. Gradually the tiny figures stopped following, pausing to reorganise their lines. It's lucky for us we have our suits on, Groves said. This isn't funny any more. Scylla bent down and pulled up a clump of weeds. He tossed the clump at the line of knights. They scattered. Let's go, Bassett said. Let's leave. Leave? Let's get out of here. Bassett was pale. I can't believe it. Must be some kind of hypnosis, some kind of control of our minds. It can't be real. Scylla caught his arm. Are you all right? What's the matter? Bassett's face was contorted strangely. "'I can't accept it,' he muttered thickly. "'Shakes the whole fabric of the universe, all basic beliefs. "'Why, what do you mean?' Groves put his hand on Bassett's shoulder. "'Take it easy, doctor. "'But, General, I know what you're thinking. "'But it can't be. "'There must be some rational explanation. "'There has to be.' "'A fairy tale,' Bassett muttered. "'A story.' "'Coincidence.' The story was a social satire, nothing more. A social satire, a work of fiction. It just seems like this place. The resemblance is only... What are you two talking about? Carmichael said. This place, Bassett pulled away. We've got to get out of here. We're caught in a mind web of some sort. What's he talking about? Carmichael looked from Bassett to Groves. Do you know where we are? We can't be there, Bassett said. Where? He made it up. A fairy tale, a child's tale. No, a social satire, to be exact, Groves said. What are they talking about, sir? Scylla said to Commander Carmichael. Do you know? Carmichael grunted. A slow light dawned on his face. What? Do you know where we are, sir? Let's get back to the globe, Carmichael said. Groves paced nervously. He stopped by the port, looking out intently, peering into the distance. More coming, Bassett said. Lots more. What are they doing out there now? 
still working on their tower. The little people were erecting a tower, a scaffolding up the side of the globe. Hundreds of them were working together, knights, workmen, archers, even women and boys, horses and oxen pulling tiny carts with drawing supplies from the city. A shrill hubbub penetrated the rexenoid hull of the globe, filtering to the four men inside. Well, Carmichael said, what will we do? Go back? I've had enough, Groves said. All I want now is to go back to Terra. Where are we? Scylla demanded for the tenth time. Doc, you know. Tell me, damn it. All three of you know. Why won't you say? Because we want to keep our sanity, Bassett said, his teeth clenched. That's why. I sure like to know, Scylla murmured. If we went over in the corner, would you tell me? Bassett shook his head. Don't bother me, Major. It just can't be, Grove said. How could it be? And if we leave, we'll never know. We'll never be sure. It'll haunt us all our lives. Were we really here? Does this place really exist? And is this place really... There was a second place, Carmichael said abruptly. A second place? In the story. A place where the people were big. Bassett nodded. Yes, it was called... What? Brobdingnag. Brobdingnag. Maybe it exists, too. Then you really think this is? Doesn't it fit his description? Bassett waved toward the port. Isn't that what he described? Everything small, tiny soldiers, little walled cities, oxen, horses, knights, kings, pennants, drawbridge, moat, and their damn towers, always building towers and shooting arrows. Doc, Scylla said, whose description? No answer. Could, could you whisper it to me? I don't see how it can be, Carmichael said flatly. I remember the book, of course. I read it when I was a child, as we all did. Later on I realised it was a satire of the manners of the times. But good Lord, it's either one or the other, not a real place. Maybe he had a sixth sense. Maybe he really was there, here, in a vision. Maybe he had a vision. They say that he was supposed to have been psychotic toward the end. Brobdingnag, the other place. Carmichael pondered. If this exists, maybe that exists. It might tell us... We might know for sure. Some sort of verification. Yes, our theory. Hypothesis. We predict that it should exist too. Its existence would be a kind of proof. The L theory, which predicts the existence of B. We've got to be sure, Bassett said. If we go back without being sure, we'll always wonder. When we're fighting the Ganymedans, we'll stop suddenly and wonder, was I really there? Does it really exist? All these years we thought it was just a story, but now... Groves walked over to the control board and sat down. He studied the dials intently. Carmichael sat down beside him. See this, Groves said, touching the big central meter with his finger. The reading is up to live. One hundred. Remember where it was when we started? Of course, at Nessie, at zero. Why? Nessie is neutral position our starting position, back on Terra. We've gone the limit one way, Carmichael. Bassett is right. We've got to find out. We can't go back onto Terra without knowing if this really is... you know. You want to throw it back all the way? Not stop at zero? Go on to the other end? The other Liu? Groves nodded. All right. The commander let his breath out slowly. I agree with you. I want to know too. I have to know. Dr. Bassett, Groves brought the doctor over to the board. We're not going back to Terra, not yet. The two of us want to go on. On? Bassett's face twitched. You mean on beyond, to the other side? They nodded. There was silence. Outside the globe, the pounding and ringing had ceased. The tower had almost reached the level of the port. We must know, Groves said. I'm for it, Bassett said. Good, Carmichael said. I wish one of you would tell me what it is you're talking about, Scylla said plaintively. Can't you tell me? Then here goes. Groves took hold of the switch. He held it for a moment, sitting silently. Are we ready? 
Ready, Bassett said. Grows through the switch all the way down. Shapes, enormous and confused. The globe floundered, trying to right itself. Again they were falling, sliding about. The globe was lost in a sea of vague, misty forms, immense dim figures that moved on all sides of them, beyond the port. Bassett stared out, his jaw slack. What? Faster and faster the globe fell. Everything was diffused, unformed. Shapes like shadows drifted and flowed outside, shapes so huge that their outlines were lost. Sir, Stiller muttered, Commander, hurry, look! Carmichael made his way to the port. They were in a world of giants. A towering figure walked past them, a torso so large they could only see a portion of it. There were other shapes, but so vast and dim they could not be identified. All around the globe was a roaring, a deep undercurrent of sound like the waves of a monstrous ocean, an echoing sound, a booming that tossed and bounced the globe around and around. Groves looked up at Bassett and Carmichael. Then it's true, Bassett said. This confirms it. I can't believe it, Carmichael said. But this is a proof we asked for. Here it is, out there. Outside the globe something was coming closer, coming ponderously toward them. Scylla gave a sudden shout, moving back from the port. He grabbed up the Boris gun, his face ashen. Groves, Bassett cried, throw it to neutral, quick, we've got to get away. Carmichael pushed Scylla's gun down. He grinned fixedly at him. Sorry, this time it's too small. A hand was reached toward them, a hand so large that it blotted out the light. Fingers skin with gaping pores, nails great tufts of hair. The globe shuddered as the hand closed around them from all sides. General, quick! Then it was gone. The pressure ceased, winking out. Beyond the port was nothing. The dials were in motion again, the pointer rising up towards Nessie, towards neutral, toward terror. Bassett breathed a sigh of relief. He removed his helmet and mopped his forehead. We got away, Groves said, just in time. A hand, Scylla said, reaching for us. A big hand. Where were we? Tell me. Carmichael sat down beside Groves. They looked silently at each other. Carmichael grunted. We mustn't tell anyone. No one. They wouldn't believe us. And anyhow, it would be very damaging if they did. A society can't learn something like this. Too much would totter. He must have seen it in a vision. Then he wrote it up as a children's story. He knew he could never put it down as fact. Something like that. So it really exists. Both exist. And perhaps others. Wonderland, Oz, Pellucidar, Erewhon. All the fantasies, dreams. Groves put his hand on the commander's arm. Take it easy. We'll simply tell them the ship didn't work. As far as they're concerned, we didn't go anywhere, right? Right. Already the vid screen was sputtering, coming to life. An image was forming. Right, we won't say anything. Just the four of us will know. He glanced at Scylla. Just the three of us, I mean. On the vid screen, the image of the Senate leader was fully formed. Commander Carmichael, are you safe? Were you able to land? Mars sent us no report. Is your crew all right? Bassett peered out of the port. We're hanging about a mile up from the city, Terror City, dropping slowly down. The sky is full of ships. We don't need help, do we? No, Carmichael said. He began to fire the brake rocket slowly, easing the ship down. Some day, when the war is over, Bassett said, I want to ask the Ganymedians about this. I'd like to find out the whole story. Maybe you'll get your chance, Grove said, suddenly sobered. That's right, Ganymede. Our chance to win the war certainly fizzled. The Senate leader is going to be disappointed, Carmichael said grimly. You may get your wish very soon, Doctor. The war will probably be over shortly, now that we're back, empty-handed. 
The slender yellow Ganymedon moved slowly into the room, his robes slithering across the floor after him. He stopped, bowing. Commander Carmichael nodded stiffly. I was told to come here, the Ganymedon lisped softly. They tell me that some of our property is in this laboratory. That's right. If there are no objections, we would like to... Go ahead and take it. Good. I am glad to see there is no animosity on your part. Now that we are all friends again, I hope that we can work together in harmony, on an equal basis of... Carmichael turned abruptly away, walking toward the door. Your property is this way. Come along. The Ganymedon followed him into the central lab building. There, resting silently in the centre of the vast room, was the globe. Groves came over. I see they've come for it. Here it is, Carmichael said to the Ganymedon. Your spaceship. Take it. Our time ship, you mean. Groves and Carmichael jerked. Your what? The Ganymedian smiled quietly. Our time ship, he indicated the globe. There it is. May I begin moving it onto our transport? Get Bassett, Carmichael said. Quick. Groves hurried from the room. A moment later he returned with Dr. Bassett. Doctor, this Ganny is after his property. Carmichael took a brief, deep breath. His, his time machine. Bassett leapt. His what? His time machine. His face twitched. Suddenly he backed away. This, a time machine? Not what we, not. Groves calmed himself with an effort. He addressed the Ganymedian as casually as he could, standing to one side, a little dismayed. May we ask you a couple of questions before you take your, your time ship? Of course, I will answer as best I can. This globe, it, it goes through time, not space. It's a time machine. Goes into the past, into the future. That is correct. I see a Nessie on the dial. That's the present. Yes. The upward reading is the past. Yes. The downward reading is the future, then. One more thing, just one more. A person going back into the past would find that because of the expansion of the universe, the Ganymedian reacted. A smile crossed his face, a subtle, knowing smile. Then you have tried out the ship? Groves nodded. You went into the past and found everything much smaller, reduced in size? That's right, because the universe is expanding. And the future, everything increased in size, expanded. Yes, the Ganymedian smile broadened. It is a shock, is it not? You are astonished to find your world reduced inside, populated by minute beings. But size, of course, is relative, as you discover when you go into the future. So that's it, Groves let out his breath. Well, that's all. You can have your ship. Time travel, the Ganymedian said regretfully, is not a successful undertaking. The past is too small, the future too expanded. We considered this ship a failure. The Ganny touched the globe with his feeler. We could not imagine why you wanted it. It was even suggested that you stole the ship to use, the Ganny smiled, to use to reach your colonies in deep space. But that would have been too amusing. We could not really believe that. No one said anything. The Ganny made a whistling signal. A work crew came filing in and began to load the globe onto an enormous flat truck. So that's it, Groves muttered. It was terror all the time, and those people, they were our ancestors. About 15th century, Bassett said, or so I'd say by their costumes, Middle Ages. They looked at each other. Suddenly Carmichael laughed, and we thought it was... We thought we were at. I knew it was only a child story, Bassett said. A social satire, Groves corrected him. Silently they watched the Ganymedians trundle their globe out of the building onto the waiting cargo ship. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past 
and comment below.